So I want you to be paying attention today, see if you can figure out where that title is coming from. So caught in a palm tree, just be listening. So anyhow, an Indian bride called off her own wedding <coughs> after getting a look at her groom for the first time on their wedding day. At a reception preceding the ceremony, the bride and groom both uh, lifted their veils and saw one another for the first time. But the would-be bride didn't like what she saw. According to local news reports, the woman complained the man was too dark-skinned and appeared to be too old. After the woman called off the wedding, the families that had arranged the marriage began fighting, stopping only when police were called to the scene. <coughs> so, you know, they lifted their veils in this uh, little ceremony preceding uh, the wedding, and uh, we're going to find out today that uh, maybe Jacob should have done that, or Judah, I mean, Judah should have done that, uh, lifted the veil before he did the things that he did. Uh, but again, it's the sovereignty of God at work, <coughs> and his providence is, is uh, happening even through the things that, uh, that, the poor decisions that we make as human beings, right? God can still use that uh, for his glory and for his plan and purpose. <coughs> so, um, you know, th these veils were here. The veil for Jacob, as we're going to see with Tamar the, today as well. And, but um, there was a trash can veil that our boys used. Um, and you've, you've probably heard the story before from us, but our two oldest boys were wrestling in one of the bedrooms in the house that we were renting in California, and Judy heard a loud noise and went to investigate. <clears throat> Both boys were sitting on the bed when Judy arrived, and she asked them what had happened, and they weren't immediately eager to share. <clears throat> Judy saw the trash can sitting in the middle of the room along the wall instead of where it normally sits, so she went over and moved the trash can to find a hole in the wall in the shape of one of our boys' back ends. <coughs> they were wrestling and busted a hole in the wall uh, of a textured wall, mind you, and I knew I couldn't repair and match the texture. There wasn't anything I could do. So we called a professional who did an amazing job of matching that texture uh, there in the hole in the wall from a boy's rear end. <coughs> I also had a clay veil that uh, happened um, you've probably heard this story, too, from me, uh, if you've been here a while. I've, um, I bought Judy a couple of vases when I was traveling uh, in Hungary and Romania, and uh, so I brought this one little black vase home, and it was sitting on the mantel, again, in, <coughs> in the rental house in California. And when we were moving from California to Pennsylvania, I was packing up the items from the mantel um, over the fireplace, and uh, that black vase was there, and when I took it down, I noticed that it didn't quite look a, as uh, perfect as it did when I brought it home uh, from Romania. And I noticed that it didn't look the same, and the boys had broken a piece out of the vase and repaired it themselves. <coughs> I never noticed because the repaired section was facing the wall. So I looked at that vase, you know, how often, and they had used clay to repair it and even painted it the same black color as the rest of the vase. And, and of course, uh, it was a clay veil that I saw instead of a trash can veil that day. <coughs> and so uh, certain things have been veiled for me for a little while and from Judy as well. Perhaps all of us have experienced some kind of veiled deception in our lives. We've had to be careful how we react when the deception is revealed because we may be guilty of the same kind of deception. And so I want you to keep that in mind this morning as we go through this passage of Scripture. <clears throat> as we're going to see today, Judah and his family were plagued with sin and deception. Two of Judah's sons were uh, disciplined by the Lord and lost their lives. Judah was repentant when his sin and deception was revealed, and he received forgiveness through the grace of God. And we will see in this passage today that God's grace is amazing. Isn't it? You believe that today is grace um, meaning that we don't get what we deserve. He doesn't give us what we deserve, and uh, it's amazing. And so as we think about that, uh, would you just bow your heads with me this morning as we commit to the Lord in prayer? <coughs> Lord, we come to you today as uh, uh, people who are hungry for your word. Lord God, we, uh, we hunger and thirst for righteousness. We we want to learn about you. We want to know more about you. We want to become more like Jesus. And I pray today that as we look at this passage of Scripture, that you would speak through your Holy Spirit to hearts and minds. I pray that uh, as I preach, Lord God, that it wouldn't be my words but yours that people hear today, that they would hear your voice and not mine. 
Lord, I'm simply a cracked and chipped vessel uh, that, that's willing to stand up here and, and represent you. And I pray that I would represent you well today. <clears throat> and so, Lord, I, we commit this passage to you, to you, and we just pray that you would reveal to us your amazing grace as we look at it together. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking at two points today, de- descent and deception. And it, the passage isn't broken into equal parts, but it's broken into two. But Let's look at verses 1 to 11 as we look at the first point, which is descent. <clears throat> this is what God's Word says. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down uh, to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son uh, who was named Er. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. And it was, it was at Kezev uh, that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, uh, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Lie with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so uh, whenever he lay with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from producing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, uh, live as a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. <clears throat> so we see this descent. Uh, first of all, we see in verses 1 to 5, Judah's marriage. Um, and it says, at this time, refers to the time after Joseph was sold to the Midianites, and they took him to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar. Now, while that's happening to Joseph, Judah leaves his brothers and goes down to Adullam and stays with Hira. It's assumed that Judah is still living in Hebron with his father Jacob when he makes this move. And even though Adullam is northwest of Hebron, uh, Judah is going down. Hebron is in the mountains and Adullam is in the lowlands. So that's why it's saying he's going down even though he's headed north. And it was approximately two and a half miles apart. Uh, so that's uh, the difference there. While in Adullam, Judah meets uh, or met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. Her name is never revealed in Scripture. They had three sons. The firstborn son was named Er, which means awake. Their second son was named Onan, which means strong. And their third son was uh, named Shelah, which means a petition. And so Jacob and his wife... Uh, were in Kaziv uh, when Shayla was born. So they give us that little side note there. So this sets the stage for the next part of the narrative about Judah's sons and Tamar. <clears throat> and so we see uh, that he arranges this marriage, <clears throat> and that wasn't uncommon uh, in this uh, day and age. So Judah got a wife for heir, and her name was uh, Tamar, which means date palm or palm tree. She was most likely a Canaanite, like Judah's wife. Now, Er was wicked in the Lord's sight. We're not told what wicked thing or things he did in the Lord's sight. We do know that the Lord removed him from the earth because of his wickedness. Now, hopefully you won't argue with me today, but this is the amazing grace of God, right? He sees this wicked person, and he removes him from the face of the earth. It's in his grace and mercy that he is saving perhaps Tamar, perhaps Judah, perhaps coming generations. So it, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that concept sometimes, but that is God's amazing grace. In his sovereignty, he knows what's best, and in his grace and mercy, he, he raises up what kings, and he deposes kings. And he's doing the same thing here with this person, with heir, because he was this wicked person. So, um, the first principle is this, the Lord punishes the wicked. He does do that. 
The Lord is holy and just, therefore he has to punish sin. Romans 6.23 tells us that what we earn or deserve for our sin is death. It's not a physical death, but a spiritual death. It's a separation from God for all of eternity. And he does not always require the life of the sinner, but sometimes in Scripture he did. We see it. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, the Lord required their life because they offered unauthorized fire in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. So they just did what they shouldn't have done, and in a way that they weren't supposed to do it, and so the Lord required their life. Korak, uh, Dathan, and Aviram, their families and their possessions and the 250 men that followed them in their rebellion against Moses and Aaron, as we see in Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 to 35, are all taken out. <coughs> They're all killed by the Lord. Then we see in uh, Achan and his family and possessions um, for not obeying God's command to destroy everything in Jericho. If you remember, he takes uh, several items from Jericho and buries them under his tent. And then by uh, way of Lot, <coughs> they uh, draw uh, his uh, family and they say, you know, uh, J- uh, Joshua says to them, you need to tell us what's going on. What happened? And Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 to 26, and he says, well, I took these things. And he said, well, today, you know, your life is required of you. And he was killed, he and his family. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, uh, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They wanted to appear like all the money that they were giving to the apostles was how much they had sold their property for, and it wasn't. And they, they could have just given a portion. They didn't have to give it all, but they made it look as though they were giving it all. And so, you know, Ananias dies, and his wife walks in, uh, and the people that had just buried him were coming back at that same time, and they asked her the same question that they had asked Ananias, and and she said, yep, that's all the money that we got for the land. And they said, you know, the footsteps of the men that just carried your, your dead husband out are coming for you. And she drops dead. God is righteous and just. And he's holy. And he wants us to do what's right. He doesn't want, uh, here in especially the book of Acts, he doesn't want the early church to start out with deception. He wants it to be pure. So he has to remove those that are trying to create deception. And so what we see next then is this, they call it a leverate, or leverite marriage. After Er died, Judah went uh, to his second son, Onan, and asked him to fulfill his duty as a brother-in-law to produce an offspring for Er. You heard that in Deuteronomy chapter 25 this morning, <clears throat> verses 5 and 6, that that was kind of the requirement. This was a common practice that was active up to the time of Christ. It was obviously something that was practiced prior to the Mosaic Law, uh, but we see uh, the regulations in the Mosaic Law in, uh, for the Israelites in what uh, Jackie read for you this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 25. When a brother died without any <clears throat> offspring, it was the duty of his next closest brother to marry his wife and produce an heir for him. But we see Onan's wickedness here. <clears throat> he was selfish and greedy. Onan understood that if he produced an heir for uh, an heir for heir, that's two different words, <laughs> that the child would receive the firstborn son's share of Judah's inheritance. Onan uh, was only thinking about himself and what he stood to inherit. He was going to inherit more because heir is gone and there is no uh, heir. To replace him, sorry. <laughs> I'm not trying to, anyhow, it's just what it is. So he faked his obedience. <clears throat> he faked his obedience. Um, Hamilton in his commentary says, the syntax of verse 9 does not refer to one time when Onan had sex with T- Tamar, but to whenever he had sex with her. So every time that Onan was intimate with Tamar, he practiced what they call coitus interruptus, so that he would not get her pregnant. And this was considered wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord required his life. This goes back to our first principle, that the Lord punishes the wicked. Again, we see his grace and mercy here in uh, removing Onan from, this, uh, from the equation. The second principle today is this. 
Selflessness is pleasing to the Lord. That's not what Onan was practicing. He was not being selfless. He was being selfish. He was coveting what he perceived would be an incredible inheritance for him. <clears throat> and while Leverite, Leverite marriage is not practiced in our culture today, there are other ways we can be selfless in our relationships, whether with family or friends. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying uh, their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. So being selfless and helping others out <coughs> is pleasing to God. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. We're supposed to be just like Jesus Christ. Here and it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, again, we, selflessness is pleasing to God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 says this, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So we need to act towards others, whether it's family or friends, in a way that's selfless. So is there a family member or a friend that could use some help right now, whether it's physical, financial, or some other way? Your selfless act may be just what they need. So I want you to consider that today. We see Judah's deception here. Here's what he said. Judah tells Tamar to live as a widow in her father's house until Shela grows up. This would have been, unu this would have been unusual in their culture, Judah should have taken her into his household and provided for her, but what he said was not what he was thinking. We see that then. What he thought is he's afraid that if he gives Tamar to Shayla as his wife, that Shayla will die too. He's like, now nah, I got no kids. I got no, no sons, no one to inherit um, or be his heir. Kyle and Dillich say this, the sudden death of his two sons so soon after their marriage with Tamar uh, made Judah hesitate to give her the third as a husband also, thinking very likely according to a superstition which we find in Tobit chapter 3, verse 7 and following, that either she herself or marriage with her had been the cause of her husband's deaths. That's what perhaps he's thinking. Uh, Walton says, alternatively, women who seemed prone to become widows were in danger of being suspected of witchcraft. So perhaps that's what Judah, because he's associating with the Canaanites now, right? He married a Canaanite woman. It was Shua's uh, daughter. He's, uh, you know, hooked up his, his sons with a Canaanite woman, potentially. And so maybe he's uh, believing all of these lies, these superstitions, these um, uh, different things about Tamar. Now, what, what is he missing, though? What is he missing? His two sons' deaths were not Tamar's fault, right? It was their fault. They were wicked. And Judah did not recognize the sin in his own children. And had he done that, he could have cautioned them. And the same is true for us as parents. We need to recognize the sin in our children. That's easier to do, right, when they're still in our household and they're younger. But as they become adults, we need to lovingly confront our children about their sin. As adults, they are ultimately responsible for their sin, but we still need to speak into their lives. We still need to caution them. And we will see that Judah's deception will backfire on him in just a little bit. Some time passes as the narrative continues. Then we come into our second point today, which is deception. And this is verses uh, 12 to 30. And we'll just kind of break it down into smaller sections. So we see uh, Judah's wife's death in verse 12. Look at that uh, uh, verse with me, if you would. <clears throat> After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went uh, up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hira, the Adulamite, went with him. And so Wolke believes that verses 1 to 11 covers a period of 20 years. We just talked about that whole section. While verses 12 to 30 uh, covers a period of no longer than a year. So this is a, what we're going to be looking at now. This section happens 
in a short, shorter period of time. At the beginning, at the beginning of this long uh, period, this year-long period, Judah's wife died. And after Judah recovered from his grieving period, he resumed his regular activities. One of those activities was to participate in the celebration surrounding the shearing of sheep. So he is heading up to Timnah, and he took Hira with him, and they traveled north to Timnah. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of maps here, because um, scholars are divided on the exact location of Timnah. Some believe it was in the lowlands. That's that first little spot that you see there. Others believe it's in the highlands. So there's another Timnah Sarah that you'll see. That same, it's on that same ridge line, but it's further north. Um, so we don't really know which one they're talking about here, because to be honest with you, the commentaries were split down the middle. Um, so either way, Judah and Hira uh, would have gone up to Timnah from Adullam. Next, we see that Tamar uh, has continued to grieve the loss of her two husbands. Her time of mourning hasn't stopped. It's been years. You know, she lost Er, and then she lost Onan, and uh, Onan, I mean, and, uh, and she's still in her widow's clothes. She hasn't uh, stopped that. Uh, Judah gets over it in the allotted amount of time, right? If it's a month or however long it was that he was supposed to mourn. He did it, and he's like, it's time to move on. Let's, uh, let's go up here and party with the sheep shears. But Tamar is not feeling that same way. Um, t- just recently, Judy and I were uh, reading a little bit about Queen Victoria, and one of the things that Judy came across was that Queen Victoria, after her husband, um, King Albert, uh, passed away, uh, she wore black the rest of her life. It was another 40 years. She never stopped mourning the King Albert, or Prince Albert, I mean, not King Albert, Prince Albert. Pretty fascinating. But Tamar has, is doing the same thing. Now, she's setting the trap. Look at verses 13 to 23. She's setting a trap here. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way um, to Timnah to shear his sheep, She took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to um, Anim, or Anam, something like that, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Shelah had grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah uh, saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you, she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it, she asked. He said, What pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah uh, sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman. But he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, Where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at at Enam? Uh, There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So they went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who live there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has, or uh, we will become a laughingstock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. <clears throat> so we see this trap that's been set. We don't know who told Tamar about her father-in-law's travel plans, but this was perhaps the opportunity she'd been waiting for. She recognized that Judah had lied to her about giving Shayla to her as a husband. She took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and sat down at the entrance to Anam. Waltke says, according to a Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Assyrian law, the daughters, wives, and concubines of free Assyrian males, as well as sacred prostitutes, must be veiled in public, but a whore must not be but must not veil herself. So that kind of tells us a little bit that she's not acting as a prostitute, as we would think today, or as a whore, but more as a shrine prostitute. So Tamar had to think about her future, since Judah was not fulfilling his duty as her father-in-law. She was part of Judah's family now, because she had married heir. So now we see um, the proposition. 
Judas saw her and assumed she was perhaps a shrine prostitute because she had covered her face. Shrine prostitutes would cover their face with a veil as a symbol of being the bride of the god or idol that they worshipped. Judah approaches her and, and propositions her to sleep with him. Judah had no idea that she is actually his daughter-in-law, Tamar. So then we move from the proposition to the price. Tamar asks what Judah will give her to sleep with him, and Judah promises to send a young goat. <clears throat> the fact that Judah did not have money or a young goat with him is probably an indication that his act of sexual immorality was not premeditated. He wasn't initially planning to do this. He was acting impulsively and gave in to the temptation of being satisfied sexually, especially since his wife was now dead. Third, we see the pledge. Tamar does not want to be uh, deceived and lied to again, so she presses Judah to give her something as a pledge until he sends her the young goat. Judah does not suspect anything, so he asks her, what pledge uh, should I give you? And Tamar knows exactly what she's doing so that she will not be uh, so that she'll be protected in the future. <clears throat> she asks Judah for her seal and its cord and the staff in his hand. Now, the seal would have been made of metal or stone and was probably a cylinder that it, when you would roll it over some clay, some soft clay, <clears throat> it uh, would leave its imprint. The seal would have, would have had a design or marking on it that was unique to Judah. Later on, it would have had perhaps his name. He would use that seal in business transactions and communications so that people knew that it was coming from him. He, uh, like I said, could roll the cylinder seal over soft clay and, a, and impress his unique mark on it. And the cylinder had a cord that went through it so it could be worn around the neck so he wouldn't lose it. And Judah's staff represented authority and probably had his unique identifying mark etched on top of it. So all of these would be identifying factors for who they were. And so, once the pledge was exchanged, Judah slept with Tamar. Her uh, demand that her father-in-law father a child by her, since he refuses to give her his son, is probably consistent with accepted ethical practices at her time. Both Hittite, which is the 14th and 13th century B.C., and Middle Assyrian laws legislated that if a married man died and his brother also died, that his father shall take her. There shall be no punishment. Now, the Mosaic law did not go this far, but her actions are not inconsistent with the principle of the deceased brother's widow must not marry outside the family, Deuteronomy 5.5. 5. Now, that's what Waltke says in his commentary. Of course, Judah was not knowingly agreeing to this law. So we see this third principle today, that sexual immorality is wrong. Even though Judah was no longer married, it was still wrong for him to use a prostitute to satisfy his sexual desires. Sexual immorality comes in many forms. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 says, You shall not commit adultery. Adultery is any sexual activity outside of marriage. The Lord told the Israelites not to participate in the sexual practices of the Canaanites. We see that in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 to 29. And this lists quite a few. Most of them had to do with sexual relations with various family members. Don't do it, he says. Whether it's a close relative, a mother, a father's wife, a sister, grandchildren, an aunt or uncle, daughter-in-law, brother's wife, neighbor's wife, homosexuality, he says don't sleep with a man like you sleep with a woman, and any animal. He says don't do that. That's what the Canaanites are doing, and it's wrong. Jesus elevated the command to not commit adultery from the physical act to the heart when he said this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he's like, it's not just about the physical act, it's about the heart. Paul, writing to the Corinthian believers, tells them not to unite their bodies with a prostitute. That's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 13 to 20. The writer of Hebrews tells us this, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And so maybe the next step that you need to take today is to confess any sexual immorality in my life, whether it's physical or mental, and seek help to stop it. Guess what? You can't do it on your own. I've heard too many people say, oh, I'm gonna, I can do it, I can handle it. You can't. 
I'm telling you today, you need accountability. You need somebody that's going to come alongside you and hold you accountable so that you won't fall into the sexual temptations. Trust me in this. And so what his first two sons were unable or unwilling to do, Judah unknowingly, unknowingly does. The next point we see is the pregnancy. Tamar becomes pregnant from the single sexual encounter with Judah. When she returned to her father's home, she changed back into her widow's clothes. And then we see the promise. Judah keeps his promise by sending a young goat with his friend Hira so he can get his seal, cord, and staff back. Well, he says he has the honor, uh, he, yeah, he has the honor to keep his obligation to a prostitute, but not to his daughter-in-law. Like, he's really honorable now, right? I'm going to send her that coat. But he doesn't kept his word with his daughter-in-law. When Hira arrived, he could not find the woman, so he asked the men of the town where the shrine prostitute was. They told him that there had not been a shrine prostitute there. There. Hira reported back to Judah about not being able to find the woman and that the men of the town said there was no shrine prostitute there. Judah told Hira to forget about the woman because they, he did not want to become a laughingstock to the people of Anam. Judah is like a, a reputable gentleman who unwittingly, quote-unquote, loses his credit card in, in a brothel. That's what Waldke says. I think that's a funny, funny statement. He told Hira that he attempted to keep his promise to the woman. He, did, he had done his due diligence. So we are given a time stamp at the beginning of verse 24 that three months have passed. This is the springing of the trap. Look at verses 24 to 26. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shelah. And uh, he did not sleep with her again. So we see the springing of the trap. Judah is informed about Tamar's pregnancy. The informant is again left unnamed, just like the informant that told Tamar that Judah was going to Timnah. They told him that Tamar was guilty of prostitution and had become pregnant. At three months, Tamar could no longer, uh, was no longer able to hide the fact that she was pregnant. And so what was, uh, why was Judah informed here? That's really the question we might need to ask ourselves. And Matthew says this, Such news would readily be passed along to Judah, for uh, she evidently still had marital obligations to Judah's family. He had not released her to marry another, which later was an option provided in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 10. So whether Judah wanted to admit it or not, Tamar was, not part of his uh, was now part of his family and his responsibility. It did not matter that he tried to pass off his responsibility to her father. When he says, just go back and, and you know, live as a widow with your father until Shayla's old enough, even though that's not what he meant. And so Judah had to deal with the situation. And we see his reaction. He asks that Tamar be brought out and burned to death. This seemed like a pretty harsh punishment. In the Mosaic law, burning someone to death was reserved for a man who sleeps with a woman and her daughter at the same time. All of them were burned to death or for a priest's daughter who acts as a whore. That was the only two reasons. Most of the time they were uh, stoned to death. <laughs> Still a horrible death. But the fourth principle today is this. It's easy to condemn others for the sin we struggle with, isn't it? Boy, it's easy to see our, the sin we struggle with in other people. And it's so easy to go, oh, look, I can't believe they're doing that. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I am too. Judah had no problem condemning Tamar for being sexually immoral, even though he had also been sexually immoral. The same happens with us today when we condemn others, whether openly or in our hearts and minds, for the same sin that we struggle with. We may look at family members, friends, colleagues, neighbors, fellow believers, and condemn them for doing any number of things, right? We may condemn them for gossiping, for being spendthrifts, for not being as spiritual as I am, 
for being sexually immoral, for struggling with an addiction, being prideful, coveting things, lying, stealing, using God's name as a cuss word, not handling relationships well. Well, we can, and the list just goes on and on and on. We can really condemn in others what we struggle with in our, in our own lives. And so maybe you're ready to take that next step today. And that's to repent of my sin and extend grace to those who are struggling with the same sin. Judah is about to be confronted with his own hypocrisy. We see Tamar's defense. She uses Judah's pledge to protect herself from being burned to death. She sends a message to Judah with the seal, cord, and staff and asks him to identify the owner. She states that the owner of those items is the man she is pregnant by. And then we see Judah's repentance here. He recognized his seal, his cord, and his staff. He acknowledges that Tamar's defense was right. Matthew says Judah's remark did not mean necessarily that her action was approved. Rather, Judah acknowledged that her motivation was consistent with the purpose of Levite marriage, whereas Judah had attempted to circumvent the custom. He had withheld his son, Shelah, from her. Principle five is this today, repentance brings forgiveness. Judah's response to Tamar shows that he was repentant for his sin of lying and deceiving. The fact that he did not sleep with her again is also evidence of his repentance. And it's important that for you and I to repent of our sins so that we can experience God's forgiveness as well. John writes in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's another time stamp for us as we uh, see the birth of Judah and Tamar's sons. Look at verses 27 to 30. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, This one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out, and she said, So this is how you were broken out. And he was named parrots. When his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, uh, came out, he was given the name Zara. So what we see here, when the time came, so we can assume that that six months have passed, it's now time for Tamar to give birth. Tamar was not as fortunate as Rebecca, who inquired of the Lord about the jostling in her belly and found out that she was having twin boys. In Genesis chapter 25, Tamar found out the day of, her birth, of their birth that she was carrying twins. So you see this jostling for position again. One of the babies put his hand out and the midwife tied a scarlet thread on his wrist to identify him as the firstborn. The baby pulled his hand back inside and the other baby then came out first. This is similar to, the, to what happened with Jacob and Esau, except that Jacob came out second, holding on to Esau's heel. Eventually, Jacob was chosen as the covenant carrier. So the boy's name we, we see here is Peretz, which means broken out or breach, and Zarak, which means rising, scarlet, or brightness. Wolke well, says, Tamar, a wrong wife, meaning Canaanite, saves the family by her loyalty to it. The four women in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, Christ, have Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba all come from outside of Israel and have a highly irregular and potentially scandalous marriage union. But because of their faith, God deems them worthy to carry royal seed. Isn't that interesting? Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 tell us this. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Peretz and Zerach, whose mother was Tamar, uh, Peretz the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, and the list goes on to David, and then David down to Jesus. So it's utterly astounding, Waltke says, that Judah, in connection with the twelve sons of Jacob, has his name written on the gates of heavenly Jerusalem, Roman, uh, Revelation 21.12. He stands as a witness to God's amazing grace. He fails as a son of the covenant by intermarrying with Canaanites and behaving like them. 
He fails as a father. His two sons are wicked and killed by God. And as a father-in-law, by deceiving Tamar, here's the great part, even the worst sort of sinners can enter heaven by God's redemptive grace. Aren't you glad for that today? God still uses the line of Judah through Peretz to bring about Jesus Christ who died on a cross to take our punishment for sin. And that's true for every one of us today too. You see, we're all born sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't reach the perfection of God because of that sin in our lives. We all deserve to be separated from God for eternity. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. It's a spiritual death, a separation from God. The second part of that verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're all, we were all created by a loving God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Aren't you glad for that today? Jesus died for all of us. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He came alive again the third day according to the Scriptures. He fulfilled prophecy from the Old Testament thousands of years before. And we can all receive God's redemptive grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Uh, you know, it tells us it's... it's for it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And so maybe you're ready to take that third next step today on the back of your communication card, and that's to receive God's free gift of salvation by believing in His grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I encourage you to take that step today. Mark that, mark that circle on your communication card Put your name on the front. Let me know that you made that decision today. That's an incredible decision. And it's because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross that we're able to have that life, eternal life, and to be saved. We just have to have faith in Jesus. And he provides that for us. And so as you allow that message to resonate in your heart today. Would you just bow your heads with me as the worship team cons, as the ushers prepare to take up the tithes and offerings and the communication cards. Lord, we just thank you for your word today. Thank you for the power of it and to bring conviction in our hearts and minds. I pray that you would accomplish that. You know each person's heart and what they're struggling with, Lord God, and I pray that you would just minister to them, help them to understand that there is help and hope through your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we just lift it up to you today. We ask all this in your precious son's name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing, I Speak Jesus? Mm -hmm.